Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I am the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ in Newburgh, Indiana. If you'd like to stop by and visit us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road. We gather at 9 a.m. on Sundays for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship. We also gather on Sunday afternoons at 4 for another worship period, if that's more convenient for you. And you can find us at the same location at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another Bible study. You're welcome to join us for any and all of those opportunities to study God's Word and to worship Him and to have fellowship with other Christians. You're also welcome to get in touch with us at 812-550-6234 or info at riverridgechurch.org. Those are great ways to get to get your questions or comments to us as well as to enter in your requests for uh, topics to address on this program or on our radio show, which by the way you can find at 98.5 FM on Sundays at 2, also on 1400 AM. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. On today's show, we are going to examine the letters that Paul, shortly thereafter, wrote to this church at Thessalonica after having been run out of town. Now, I should preface our study of these letters by saying that most of Paul's letters address specific problems. So, for example, when he wrote Galatians, these Christians were being misled by some false teachers who were pushing things like circumcision and adherence to the Law of Moses. Paul has to say, nope, not required for, uh, in order to be a Christian. When he writes First and Second Corinthians, he's dealing with a church that is divided and tolerating and even promoting some pretty outrageous sins, and they're ignoring each other's needs and that sort of thing. He has to correct those problems too. When Paul writes to the Christians at Rome, he is addressing a group that struggles with the Jew-Gentile relationship and how that all ought to be handled. So he does his best to address the problem. When he writes Colossians, he's uh, addressing a church that allowed some influence from a sort of quasi-Jewish mysticism that was, well, leading them astray as well. He writes letters to individuals, Timothy and Titus and Philemon, and all of these address at least some problems, not necessarily with the individuals, but problems he is enlisting their help to solve. Now, in the case of First Thessalonians, when we get to Second Thessalonians, we'll find that it, it, it colors our interpretation of the first letter in such a way as to hint at laziness. And this is born out of a, a mistaken assumption about Christ's return and the timing thereof. But by and large, the Thessalonian Christians were doing very well. The theme of these two letters can be summarized uh, by just reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. More and more. This is already a clear lesson, a clear message for the Thessalonian Christians and for us, for each one of us. No matter how well you think you're doing, there's more that you could be doing. But even with that said, wouldn't it be helpful to know where they're starting? By way of analogy, I could tell you that one of my boys is a good reader. And then if you heard him read, you would be pretty skeptical. Until I add the qualifier, he's a good reader for his age. And that would help you to understand better exactly what I'm trying to say. And even then, 
that wouldn't mean a whole lot to you unless I told you that he is six years old. Now we have some clear context. That's the kind of context that I hope to help establish with you as we talk about the Christians of Thessalonica. The goal today is to introduce these two letters and to introduce this church so that we have a better idea of how well they have been doing up to this point. And that, in turn, is going to help us to better understand what Paul has in mind for their next steps. And it will help us to translate these letters lessons to ourselves. So how did this church come to be? Well, we read about that in Acts chapter 17 already, and it followed the usual pattern. Paul arrives in a town, and he first goes to the synagogue to preach to the Jews, because they already know the scriptures, they already expect the Messiah, and he tells them the Messiah has come, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. From verse 4, we learned that he had some success, but, well, it says some of them, meaning the Jews, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So, from the beginning, this church was predominantly Gentile, and it had apparently an outsized proportion of women, which I suppose tells us something about the men, namely that ours isn't the first society in history to be afflicted by deadbeats. Continuing on in verse 5, But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. So the leaders among the local Jews, those who didn't believe, decided that they couldn't have this, and they were going to be pretty obstinate about it to the point of, well, starting a riot. And we read through all of that pretty quickly, and it seems like it happened in just one day. But upon some reflection, it clearly not. This took several weeks at least. It does say in verse 2 that it was three Sabbath days in succession that he reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue. And it probably is even longer than that by the time that he's having some significant success and then meeting some significant opposition. Well, what's the result of all this? Verses 9 and 10 again. When they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So they end up taking some money from the Christians, uh, the city authorities do, and that's bad enough, but the situation is apparently so dire, so risky, that the Christians are afraid Paul and his helpers are facing, well, a mortal threat. And so they smuggle them out of town under cover of darkness. Think about this. This is a guy who has been stoned and left for dead. And when that happened, afterward he got up and walked right back into the city. This is a guy who, just prior to arriving at Thessalonica, was beaten by jailers at Philippi, and when they asked him to go away quietly, he refused and forced them to release him publicly instead. Credible threats to his life is not really a new thing for him. So why is it that he runs away with his tail between his legs this time? Is that what we read? Once again, verse 10, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. It wasn't entirely Paul's decision. These brand new Christians in Thessalonica really care about him to the point where they're willing to send him away for his own safety. Well, what happens from there? He ends up at Berea, and he has some success there, but before he's really able to establish it, the same Jewish unbelievers from Thessalonica follow him there and chase him off from Berea as well. From Berea, he ends up at Athens. He is separated from his helpers, having sent Timothy and Silas back to check in Thessalonica. While he's at Athens, he doesn't really have a whole lot of success. It's a pretty disappointing situation. Finally, after leaving Athens, he settles for a longer stint in Corinth, and there he is reunited with Silas and Timothy, and it is from there that he writes 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. In 1st Thessalonians, let's read verses 2 and 3 of the first chapter. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's a pretty good list. He's constantly thankful for what? For their work of faith. Their work of faith. This is not just a, a hollow profession of, uh, of belief in Jesus as the Son of God. 
this is borne out in their actions. They demonstrate that they have this, this belief in Jesus as the Messiah, as the chosen one. They have changed. They are different people now after discovering Christ. Similarly, he thanks God for their labor of love. Labor of love. What form does this take? Well, we don't know exactly, but we have seen one example of it already in the way that they were willing to protect Paul, even though that meant being separated from him. Apparently, there's more to it even than that. As a matter of fact, a careful reading of these two letters will reveal that they are making significant monetary sacrifices for each other's well-being and for Christians far and wide. We'll get into that a little later. Now, we can summarize these two, their, their work of faith and their labor of love, by using an expression that they are both somewhat literally and metaphorically putting their money where their mouth is. They're not just giving uh, empty professions of faith or empty professions of love. They are putting them both to work. There's one more point in verse 3, their steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what, what hope? Is this a hope for world peace? The hope of uh, getting a raise from your employer? The hope for a mild winter? No, he's obviously talking about something much bigger than that. He's talking about a hope of eternal salvation and resurrection and heaven and Christ's return and that sort of thing. So it's no wonder that uh, in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. When he says asleep there, that's a euphemism for dead. He's talking about their eternal salvation. He's talking about a reconciliation with those dead who have gone on before. He's talking about an eternal hope. Let's keep reading in chapter 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We can see elements already, just in these few verses, of the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope in Jesus. Paul has an awful lot of praise to heap on these people. Now, is this just maybe sort of like a, a proud father's exaggeration? Well, no. Verse 9, They themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The word about the Thessalonian Christians has managed to spread faster than Paul can spread it. If he wanted to brag about them, it turns out other people are already bragging about them to him. Their change in manner of life also speaks very well of them, and, and it highlights the love that they have shown, but also the challenges that they have faced. Most of them had a background of paganism. Remember, I mentioned that these were mostly Gentiles. Background in paganism, and they had to turn away from those idols to serve the living and true God. They had to change a lot about their daily lives, about their behaviors, and they did so because of that steadfast and eternal hope that they held. As the letter continues, Paul spends chapters 2 and 3 pining after these Thessalonian Christians. He wishes that he could see them again, but he's prevented from doing so by the circumstances. And I'll remind you, this is not just that the flight schedules don't quite line up, but it's a significant likelihood that if he tries, he will be beaten to death. Throughout these chapters, he talks about the example that he showed to them, and this is mostly to remind them of the love that he has for them, also of the things that they should continue to imitate about his behavior. And those things are definitely worth your time. There are many lessons to learn, both from Paul and from the people he was serving. We just don't really have time to get into great detail about it today. A few notes, though, about what they did. So, for example, in chapter 2, verse 13, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. 
to use Jesus' terminology from the parable of the sower, they had hearts that were good soil. And when the word landed on them, they didn't get hung up on the messenger, Paul. Instead, they were listening for the word of God. And that's still a struggle for many people today, putting their hopes in the messenger rather than the message. Just like all the other problems that the Thessalonian Christians faced are also going to be problems for us today. Let's pick up in verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. Now, if I were Paul in his situation, I might have wanted to downplay this threat from the Jewish authorities so as not to, you know, scare the Christians into silence or scare the Christians away from Christ. Is Paul concerned about that? Uh, not particularly. In fact, he reminds them that death is a plausible outcome of this whole ordeal. They have already endured persecution and remained steadfast and faithful. And Paul knows that. He saw it for the short time that he was there. But previous to writing this letter, he wasn't all that confident that it would continue along these lines. That's why he says in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. He wasn't sure what to expect from them. He wasn't sure that they would continue and remain steadfast. And who can blame him? But after he sent Timothy and Silas to go check, and they returned and brought this good report, he was ecstatic, and that is no small part of why he is writing this letter. In the first part of chapter 4, Paul goes over some general stuff. Let's read the first couple of verses. Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Following this, Paul discusses some sexual sins. He discusses brotherly love, which is an indirect way of referring to how some of them were providing financial support to others of them. The latter part of chapter 4 and the early part of chapter 5, Paul is talking about Jesus' second coming. Uh, the chapter 4 section is about how that will look, sort of, and the chapter 5 portion of that is about when, sort of. Let's go ahead and read that one, the first nine verses of chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober." having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, after that, the rest of chapter 5 is the typical ending stuff, some general encouragement and instruction, blessing and farewell, that sort of thing. Sounds pretty good, right? And it is pretty good. Paul so wanted to just leave it there, and to have the nascent problems fixed with the tiniest flick of the reins accomplished in such a way that most observers wouldn't have even noticed it was happening. But unfortunately, the Christians of Thessalonica weren't all that great at taking a hint, and on top of that, some other problems soon popped up. That brings us to 2 Thessalonians, and yikes, what happened? This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We really don't know exactly what's behind all of this. 
But it certainly sounds as if the persecution efforts at Thessalonica have scaled up a bit. Even back in the first letter, Paul was comforting them in chapter 4 about their fellow Christians who had died. They have not been Christians for very long at all, just maybe a couple of months, and already multiple of them have died? It's possible that's from disease, natural disaster, accident, that sort of thing, but none of those things is mentioned, and it seems like it would have been. What is mentioned is persecution, and it's quite possible that some of the Christians at Thessalonica had already been killed as a direct result of their faith. Let's keep reading, chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So there's a lot there, but first of all, it sounds like there's some kind of an imposter pushing a false doctrine, someone professing to be Paul or to write for Paul. You can see how this would be alarming. There's more to this story that isn't preserved for us, clearly. And that tells us that God doesn't think it's all that important for us to know in the first place. But the suggestion is that violence didn't work as a form of persecution. So next they tried sedition. Well, finally, after Paul spends all of chapter 2 cleaning up that mess of this false teaching, this idea that Christ had already returned... He, he deals with that, and then in chapter 3, he deals with another problem, idleness. Verses 6 through 12. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. He is talking about people loafing around, not working, and mooching off of their neighbors. Why would they do such a thing? Well, there's something to be said for the laziness that is pretty much endemic to humans. But on top of that, think about this false teaching and their confusion over exactly when the return of Christ was to come. See, Paul had told these people from the start, be ready right now. Be ready for the return any time. It's going to come like a thief in the night when you don't expect it. And they took that to mean, well, it's probably going to be like in the next day or two. So, I mean, it's not really worth like working and stuff. And so now Paul is having to back them off of that and say, no, 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 no. Yeah, be ready right now, but also be ready anytime. Be ready for the return of Christ to come ages and ages after you have died. In fact, we do know of some things, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, that will happen first. So, if you're not seeing those things happen yet, then just keep on living more or less normally, but after the pattern of righteousness that was given by Christ. Now, that in turn, that whole understanding of this idleness and loafing and mooching has implications on our understanding of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as I mentioned earlier. Back there he said, Now concerning brotherly love you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Now, first of all, this speaks pretty well of the ones who have been financing the other one's laziness, at least up to a point. Eventually, of course, a time comes when you're not helping, you are enabling, and we all need to learn how to recognize that point. Paul was insinuating back there in 1 Thessalonians that 
Their idleness was promoting other bad behaviors like gossip and meddling, and it was bringing some level of reproach on the church from outsiders, and you could understand why outsiders would look down on them for, well, being lazy mooches. So, having tried to make that point gently and softly in the first letter, and now seeing that they didn't get it, Paul is more blunt in the second installment, and he just lays it on the line and says, cut that out. So what do we get from these two letters taken as a whole? There's always room for growth. There's always room to build. The foundation stone in our case, the rock, can definitely hold it. At the same time, we need to pay attention to what we have already built, because if we allow the elements or pests or malicious neighbors to have ready access, they just might start to weaken the lower levels of the structure to the point where the whole house is ready to collapse. A great start is a great start, but it requires follow-through and perseverance and continued hard work. Do so more and more. That was the theme with which we started in chapter 4, verse 1 of, of the first letter. The New American Standard, by comparison, renders it excel still more, which is a great way to word it and to think about it. Yes, you may be excelling. Okay, now keep going. Do even better than that. Now, if you're not a Christian yet, then I hate to be the one to break it to you, but you're not excelling in any way at all that matters over the long haul. In the second letter, let's read verses 7 through 10 of chapter 1. We're picking up in the middle of a sentence, but the idea is that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. No amount of financial success, no number of Facebook friends or Instagram likes, no amount of prestige in your job or your neighborhood or your community or even in your family will last more than a few years after you die, if it even lasts that long. And yet here we are, praising these mostly nameless Christians 2,000 years later. Why should you be forgotten while they're still remembered? Will you be consigned to that fire because of disobedience to the gospel of Jesus? Why not instead devote your time and your labor and your love and your life to the only thing that really matters? You can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh at 9 a.m. on Sundays for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, 4 p.m. for afternoon worship, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another study. If none of those works for you, but you'd still like to learn more, you can get in touch with us and we will discuss the next steps you need to take. Our phone number is 812-550-6234 and our email address is info at riverridgechurch.org. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.